You know that uh, dream that everyone has that they're running late for eighth grade midterm exam or final exam uh, for a class that they've never signed up for, but they've discovered it. Uh, in my case, it's always eighth grade, and, and I'm not usually wearing any clothes in the dream. Well, I'm having that experience right now uh, because uh, I'm not a, a computer security guy. I'm not a, a hacker. I'm something much less. Uh, I'm a professor of political science. And what, I'm, uh, what uh, my colleague Kenneth Gears and I want to talk to you about is whether and how what you all do, what you do so much better than uh, and in, in, in greater detail than I could understand, whether it could have a political impact, and in particular whether it could matter for international politics, what I study, the use of force, uh, uh, conflict, war. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And the answer, if, for those of you who want it, the bottom line and then go home, is, yeah, you could have an effect uh, for good or for ill. And uh, we're going to focus on the ill sides uh, in the briefing. But in the Q&A, if you want to talk about the good sides uh, of it, we could uh, go there as well. Now, we're going to cover the, the concept of asymmetric warfare and expand that to a concept of globalized information, uh, globalized warfare, and then put it all together with hacking. So globalized asymmetric hacking, how that could affect it. Uh, we're going to focus in on a, one case in particular, the Middle East conflict and how hacking has uh, been a part of that conflict. And then we're going to bring it back to the United States and, and also focus on what we consider to be the most powerful cyber weapon with, and then a look uh, for the future. But we've got to begin with the idea of asymmetric warfare, which is the idea of uh, as, as old as Sun Tzu. I mean, this is thousands and thousands of years old, although a lot of Beltway bandits in D.C. get money sort of reinventing this term. But what it means is going after the other side's weakness rather than going after the other side's strength. Uh, so leveraging a perceived weakness that you have uh, and turning it to a tactical advantage, sort of going after the will of the opponent rather than going after uh, the, the heart of their strength. And of course, it's used by terrorists, it's used uh, by the media, it's also uh, arguably part of the computer hacking uh, code as well. And obviously, hacking it lends itself to asymmetric involvement. It, uh, the internet is the anonymity of the internet, the deniability, particularly if you're a nation state involved in this kind of activity, the deniability that comes from uh, an internet attack. It's also very affordable, so if you are poor or have less resources than the uh, U.S. Defense Department, this is an attractive uh, force multiplier for you. But the ones I want, the aspects I want you to emphasize, because I think it's the most important one, is the ability for subcultures to connect and to mobilize, uh, the ability for non-state actors to join the fight. Now, this is a move away from the modern state. If you guys were stuck in my lecture uh, on political science intro 101, we talk about the modern era where the state has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. That's what characterizes uh, today. But what is, what is emerging is a system in which the state does not have a monopoly, is not the only actor, and is not even, in some cases, the dominant actor. And via cyber involvement, Many other groups, subcultures, uh, like-minded, left-handed uh, supporters of Governor Dean who like cats, whatever, that kind of thing can organize, find themselves, and can have an impact on politics and even on international politics, particularly the posses of the willing joining the fight who might otherwise not be willing to join a physical, kinetic, sort of throwing bombs at each other fight, but they might be willing to join a fight on the Internet. It's global, not international. It's not just between states, as I've emphasized. It's, it's uh, transnational actors throughout the states. It's people in the United States who are fighting, in, in fact, on behalf of another country uh, that the United States is not even a party to the conflict and vice versa. And it's in heavily involving commercial interests, commercial interests that are associated with the state, for instance, sort of viewed as an extension of the state, and when we get to the Middle East case, we'll uh, explore that, or else uh, commercial interests that uh, are, are just lucrative targets and able to, uh, um, uh, able to be hit. It's all part of a broader trend called the outsourcing of war. 
uh, the infamous Halliburton, uh, which is uh, supplying logistic support for the military, and then the groups like Blackwater Security, which provide security functions on the battlefield. This is all part of a trend to outsource functions that the government or the military used to do for itself. Well, what we're talking about today is that a further extension of outsourcing or allowing for groups to be fighting when they're not even enlisted into the, the military of the combatants. And corporations, we would argue, are not just targets, but they may also be involved in the attacks as well. Well, how do you do it? You, uh, it's a posse of the willing. It's, uh, I don't know if you recall the Spanish Civil War, I, the, maybe the roadie is old enough to remember the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, but the, uh, <laughs> it was, it was a war that involved, that that stimulated, uh, the, captured the imagination of people all over the world who decided to grab a gun and go join and fight on behalf of, uh, of, of the Republicans, not the current Republicans, but the, in the Spanish Civil War Republicans. Um, well, hacktivism is, is sort of the modern day equivalent of that, giving everybody a chance to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to affect the course of history. I'm going to get involved in this thing. I care about that conflict, and I don't like what is going on, and I'm going to do something about it. Well, doing something about it uh, expands the battlefield and extends the participants and increases, we would argue, the conflict in interesting ways that are beyond the control of the, the government. And there's a, a great story that my colleague told me, don't tell, this is too much of a professor thing, but the, how the Indian, how India became a possession of the, of the British crown. It started with a corporation going, corporation going, getting itself in trouble, couldn't handle the problem. The missionaries were involved, private groups were involved, and eventually called in the uh, British regular army and Queen Victoria became Empress of India. It was almost accidental, not quite accidental, but it was, almost accidental, and it was a merging of corporate and private interests uh, that had a profound political effect. And we're arguing that something like that could go on in the cyber jihad uh, arena. Well, what are the, we're talking about the most obvious forms of attack are the denial of service attacks and, and sort of web-based defacements. This is, if you're a business, this could mean loss of revenue. That could be quite profound if you uh, are a, um, a business on the edge. For the government, it's not going to bring the government to its knees, but it could have a profound loss of face. And as we'll talk about at the end, in the context of a crisis where government leaders are trying to control the course of the diplomacy, it could have the effect of taking that diplomatic contest out of control. There, a related topic which we won't go into in much detail is the question of nation state hacking. Governments actually doing this uh, in an organized and systematic way uh, that we'll, we'll touch on that briefly, but no, what we're mainly interested in is individuals and individuals doing this for a political reason. So you go to the Zone H statistics and you, you see that, of course, most hacking is done uh, in a uh, classic individualistic way because, uh, because it's there, because it's fun, because uh, whatever. But then look at the two that we've checked there, patriotism, sort of, and political reasons, arguably that you attacked a site that was identified with a group that you oppose for political, international political or domestic political reasons. That's roughly one fifth of the activity is that. That's a, a profound subset and that's what we're, that's the focus of, of this topic is the, about the one fifth that is done for political reasons. Uh, what's the most? That, that's within the last couple months, uh, that statistic, yep. But yes, of course it changes, you know, on a daily basis. Oh, is it trending? Good question. Don't know the answer to that question. Have to go back and check. Um, cyber, the, of course, the problem with the, the cyber attack, uh, if you are on the receiving end of it, is uh, identifying the source so that you can know what to do about it. And the the if you're a nation state and you are on the receiving end, the begs the question, do we go the law enforcement route? Do we go take the law into our own hands, the re direct retaliation route? 
do we take a conflict that is bothering us on the at the cyber level and take it to the kinetic level with with a bomb you've uh, you bomb us with spam we bomb you with bombs that kind of uh, thing <laughs> there's a problem with that and it's the last bullet there what do the lawyers say uh, the lawyers frown on that sort of thing um, it's it's illegal, but of course, uh, state-sponsored hacking occurs every day. This we're not confirming something that uh, is uh, not known to you. And it, there's also the interesting related problem of patriotic hackers. That is, individuals who are doing this as part, uh, they see themselves, at least in this instance, as an extension of the state, where they are uh, doing something on behalf of the state to advance uh, state policy uh, in, in some contest. Um, of course, when the state is involved directly, uh, it, it raises all sorts of questions about uh, the, the chain of evidence so that if you are going to go the law enforcement route, many of the hacker activities that the U.S. government might be involved in to get the evidence cannot be introduced in the court of law, and so it produces problems. That was the, the case with the FBI sting in, in Russia that you're all familiar with, I'm sure. And while it's hard, it may be unpopular to say this after uh, the spring of Abu Ghraib, but the U.S. is in this particular vulnerability because the U.S. Uh, tries to follow international law, at least uh, is exposed to greater uh, is greater um, criticism when it doesn't follow international law than, uh, than other Entities and so the U.S. has a particular vulnerability in in this area. Let's focus in now on the specific case of the the Middle East, and and Kenneth will go and explore that in, in greater detail. Okay, this is our case study, and uh, and one of the first things I want to say about the Middle East cyber wars is obviously there has been fighting going on in the Middle East for a long time, and probably will be in the future. Uh, but currently, there is a new avenue uh, to participate in this fight. Uh, and that's via the internet. And the interesting thing about it is you can be anywhere. Like, for instance, with the United St within the United States, there's a sizable Palestinian population, a sizable uh, Jewish population, uh, but also plenty of folks who uh, may maybe closely identify with one side or the other, and they've taken part in this uh, heavily from the United States. Uh, another aspect to it is that the cyber attacks have largely mirrored and even uh, just uh, in, uh, closely followed the activity on the ground, the intensity of the fighting. And we'll show you that uh, case to, uh, cases of uh, kidnappings and suicide bombings in which whew, right after it there was, a, there was a, an upsurge in cyber activity. Uh, w probably way less than a, com a hundred core hackers. Um, but we'll show you the websites, the web portals that they have uh, written uh, and put on the internet such that uh, you can just click uh, a couple of buttons on your computer and go to sleep at night and allow your resources to be used overnight in a cyber attack on the other side. It's kind of like if you're familiar with the SETI project, which is looking for extraterrestrial uh, life, uh, you can do the same thing. It's, it's re really uh, very cool. Uh, the, the volunteers go way into the thousands, and they can provide brute force scanning power, uh, denial of service power, and they're from all over the place. Here are some of the homelands of the volunteers. Uh, on the left side, you can see the Middle East, and, and on the right, you'll see the United States, and y Europe is in there. Uh, an interesting case is Brazil, for instance. If you know anything about the relations between uh, Brazil and the United States, uh, there's some tension there. Uh, and they have uh, a very healthy hacking culture in Brazil. Uh, and they were more than willing to lend their services to this cause. They teamed up, it was kind of a spontaneous alliance with pro-Palestinians, uh, and got involved in this conflict uh, on, on the other side, well, the other side, the, other, the, the side of the pro-Palestinian movement. And the United States was one of their targets. You can see all of the government sites uh, that were affected by denial of services or web defacements. And you'll see the part from the United States here, uh, the only con con confirmed kill that I have is, is in the Middle East. Uh, either uh, in the Middle East, I mean, it's either Jewish, Arab, or Muslim uh, country. Here's some of the cyber tools. Uh, Ping of death, you know, the 64K killer packet that will uh, take down your system if it's, uh, if it's old enough or sorry enough. Uh, evil ping, very interesting. A uh, distributed, uh, distributed ping of death that was designed in particular for this war. So came came along at this time. 
Uh, ping floods were very, uh, net, net floods were very uh, common, I'll show you, uh, during this time period. And we'll show you a, a great case of wind smurf in which a popular uh, Arab website was taken down just with a 50, 60, uh, 56K modem. In particular, I'm going to show you uh, defend attack here, okay? This was uh, very popular at the time, uh, and you're just overtaxing a server with web requests. But at the time, this was, this was a novel method. It was uh, basing your requests on the current date and time so that the web caching mechanisms, you know, if you're going to request another page within, you know, the, the two or three minutes, uh, you know, it was just going to say, hey, why don't you keep the information you've already got? It's probably the same. Uh, in this case, you kept making the web request. The script was written such that the date and time would always change. So a second later, you're forcing the server to, uh, to give up the information again. Uh, there was many versions of this uh, distributed uh, in a lot of mirror sites around the world, including as far away as the, the .to domain. And who knows who that belongs to? Tonga. Where's Tonga? South of the they're brilliant. Uh, you can believe it. I expected uh, far fewer. Anyway, they're participating in Tonga in the Arab-Israeli conflict. They got no idea. And uh, very interesting. Uh, now, the attacks focused on either side was a bit different. The pro-Israeli, the unofficial side, uh, Middle East hacker war was begun unofficially on the Israeli side, but tended to focus on extremist, terrorist political sites. The pro-Palestinians in their counterattack, they had a lot more lucrative commercial targets to go after. And I think it was only a couple of months into it uh, before the pro-Israelis thought maybe they had uh, started uh, a war that, for which they were uh, more ill-prepared uh, than the other side. You see, all the types of targets. Um, in particular, they would find you know, the channels of communication that were being used uh, not only by the leadership figures in politics on the other side, but also by the hackers on the other side. Uh, and they would go against them, you know, they would target them. Uh, and in particular, you know, they would target them to, to steal any cool new tools that were out there, rewrite them to attack the other side's uh, sites. Here is the unofficial start to the war, October 25th, 2000. Here, this is the Hezbollah site, uh, run out of Lebanon. And you have, to, you have to also look at the context of what was going on at the time. This, at this time, there were kidnappings of Israeli soldiers that had occurred in Lebanon. And uh, if you've ever been to Israel, you know that they really live minute to minute in that country uh, based on the news. I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's far more uh, intense than it is here. So that was in the news. And some Israeli hackers got together and they said it would be terrific if we took down this site. So here's the Hezbollah site. The Hezbollah followers, uh, they go to this site, and instead of seeing what they expect to see, they hear their computer speakers begin the Israeli national anthem. <laughs> there is he Hebrew writing on the site. There is English writing on the site explaining, you know, the, uh, the conflict from their perspective. You know, they're explaining this is great propaganda tool. Okay, uh, so let's go on for a second, and I'll show you. Here's a site giving a lot of instructions on what to do right during this period. Here, you know, here's an email for you to go after, webmaster at Hezbollah. Here's the Palestinian National Authority site. Here are the IP addresses uh, to hit. Uh, Wizel.com was a web attack portal on the pro-Israeli side, and it had a lot of downloads. I couldn't fit everything on here, but just below these were HezbollahWebStorm.zip, EmailBomber.zip, Things like that. And this is cool. Okay, so what, what, you know, one of the levels on which attackers want to get you is they want to make their attacks sticky. They want them to be difficult for you to get out from underneath them. Uh, so you want to think, you know, like in chess, you want to think a few moves ahead. You know, who wants to be stuck on the current move? Uh, so what they did when they started this is they bought up a lot of spellings and misspellings of the Hezbollah uh, word, you know, the transliterated from the Arabic. Uh, and so they were ready. So when Hezbollah wanted to uh, maybe try a different spelling, registering a site, or their followers wanted to try a different spelling to get the information they were after, there was more Israeli propaganda. Uh, so they had already bought, uh, registered, and configured these sites. Here are some of the Israeli hackers. Uh, and some of these guys were primarily known and still are for attacking US sites. The top two on the left, Derry Shriedman and the Analyzer, uh, both of whom uh, at 18 years of age, 
one during the first Gulf War and the second during the second Gulf War, um, hacked the Pentagon. And they eventually, you know, were caught for it. Um, uh, and most of these guys uh, went on to, of course, to start their own, uh, you know, they got arrested and they go on and eventually start their own computer security companies. Just like 2XS two, two is very interesting, and that's part of the evolution of this. The analyzer, Ehud Tannenbaum, uh, when the Middle East cyber war started, he had this company up and running, 2XS, and he, uh, let's see, he uh, sent out letters to Israeli companies around, uh, you know, Israel, saying, you have security problems on your site. So they were scanning the .il domain. We can protect you from malicious hackers belonging to Islamic groups. They signed it the White Hatted Hacker Group. He was also a part of the Israeli Internet Underground uh, on the bottom there on the right. And that was a group of Israeli techies from various firms uh, who were trying to educate uh, Israelis about what was going on uh, from the Palestinian side. Um, here's a picture of some of the guys uh, who were involved in this setting up a web portal. And this portal, uh, it was uh, designed uh, to conduct ping floods against, in particular, Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, they put their pictures on here, which is kind of interesting. I mean, does that mean that they don't fear law enforcement in Israel or they're just not so smart? I'm not sure. <laughs> here is a hacker uh, or hacker group in Israel, uh, Mossad. And if you didn't know, Mossad is the name of the Israel Intelligence Service. And so they, they took the name from that, throwing in an O. And uh, they have 67 defacements here. And this is the period, really, when the hacker war was hot. And you can see the stars indicate uh, special defacements, which are government and or military. Um, and here you can see, you know, they're hitting um, not only .ir, .qa, Qatar, uh, Iran, United Arab Emirates. They're moving out to .pk, Pakistan, uh, and others. But then you can see they also have to search for the... Uh, the dot-com and the dot-nets. We'll talk about in a minute how, how great of a target Israel was for the counterattack uh, because most all of their sites were dot-il. It really was a nice fixed target for folks around the world to methodically work through. And it ended up actually in some rather funny uh, situations. Uh, targets of pro-Israeli hackers. Uh, largely, uh, they, they were political in nature. Um, the Hamas was a very interesting case. What happened there was actually such a great hack that a lot of people begin to speculate that Israeli intelligence was involved uh, in the affair. But when folks wanted to go to uh, Hamas.org, right, they were rerouted to a couple of sites, lesbian sex and raw sex videos. And whenever the surfer tried to close their browser, another one would just pop up in its place and send them back to these sites. And, uh, and Hamas had such great difficulty uh, getting rid of this attack that they, there was some speculation at the time that, you know, pr serious professionals were involved. Um, okay, let's look on the, uh, well, we're just not quite to the Palestinian side. This is the, uh, one of the current things I found. And this shows a bit of an evolution. Magaf.org is a, is a, uh, a self-proclaimed Israeli hacker collective. And this is, this is current stuff. And it shows more of an evolution. And, and one of the reasons I want to throw this in here is it shows sort of a cross-section of this hacker group, uh, which Arab or Muslim hacker groups might have in common with Americans and others. You can see on this site um, references to Indie Media, which is a sort of an uh, international independent media organization. Uh, you, can send a, you can see references to the Rukka Society, which is an anarchist group which was largely uh, behind the WTO um, disruption in Seattle in 1999. And part of this site uh, is devoted to uh, advertising their Jabber instant messaging encryption protocol, uh, which was, is used for uh, groups around the world, you know, and it wasn't, you know, they're not trying to limit it necessarily here to Jewish groups, but to, uh, to allow them uh, even instant message uh, in encrypted fashion. Okay, on the counterattack, uh, it was very quick on the other side and actually very powerful. And I mentioned earlier, very quickly, the number of sites defaced and DDoSed went well beyond uh, what the Israelis had done. Um, and some of them were quite effective. Israel's email system, including at the Israeli foreign ministry, was down uh, for a long time. And then e-commerce sites were hit. I mean, this, this, is, the, this is the thing. The, uh, there were a lot more lucrative targets in Israel and potentially... Uh, Israel had more to lose. 
you can see that in Israel, there are more internet connections than in all of the Arab countries combined. And you know, it's it, you know just the, the nature of the states. And I don't really get into that, but uh, um, suffice it to say that the more targets you have, the more vulnerable boxes you have, um, and, and potentially the more you have to lose. Here's some of the pro-Palestinian hackers. Uh, ArabHackers.org is a place you could go to, to meet and greet and see what was going on and share tools. Um, Dodi was a, a terrific hacker who was involved in um, uh, attacking NetVision. And NetVision is the largest ISP in Israel uh, through which about 70% of internet traffic runs. Um, so obviously, just from the standpoint of quantity, you're talking about a very juicy target. But also, very interesting, um, who do you think runs the internet connections into and out of the occupied territories, the West Bank and Gaza? Uh, why, of course, it's Israel, and it goes through NetVision. Uh, so if you wanted to, uh, you know, to hit back at the Israelis in that way, potentially contacting these people or disrupting that service, uh, you had to go through Israel in the first place. And that also explains, for instance, why you're probably not likely to see a lot of great hacking activity to come out of the territories but it's going to have to come you know, with it, with, you know, from without uh, that immediate, uh, those immediate borders. GeForce Pakistan, I'll mention because they brought a lot of experience into the conflict immediately. They entered uh, the Middle East cyber war on November 3rd, 2000. And um, on the very first day they, they, they uh, entered the war, uh, it was immediately apparent they had brought a lot of uh, tradecraft and experience from the wars, the cyber wars they had uh, carried on over Kashmir with the Indians hackers. And so on November 3rd, 2000, uh, Israelis uh, found that tons of their sites had been hacked and there was lots of information asking whether the Torah allowed the killing of innocent women and children and showed Palestine in flaming letters and a lot of stuff uh, that they hadn't seen before. Here you can see on the pro-Palestinian side, and this is your chance, you know, if you have a, a cause out there that you, for, you know, for which you'd like to create an attack portal, uh, you can see what was done here in the Middle East. Um, you know, you've got to help people out here. You know, a lot of people that, you know, with their, with the, you know, their experience on, on the web, you've got to tell them, you will attack these IPs, you will attack these domain names, um, you know, but really all you have to do is click here. Uh, I'll just, uh, just read for you what it says below. It says, upon clicking defend the resistance, an automatically programmed file will be ready to stage counterattacks against the Zionist sites. Uh, this counterattack will continue as long as you have access to the internet. One small window will be opened for each link you click, and all you have to do is not close this box while you're on the net, and the program will automatically work. So make it very easy for these folks. Um, propaganda is something we really want to emphasize here. I mean, is a web defacement or potential denial of service that folks you know, may or may not uh, uh, see or feel um, if their e-commerce site is down for a couple hours, uh, compare nearly as much to a picture of somebody you potentially identify with lying dead in the streets. Probably not. Um, this is something that is asymmetric in nature, uh, extremely powerful, and again, uh, you know, in this case, the weaker side, relatively speaking. I don't, not to belittle either side or take, take um, one side or the other. This is something that in this case, very powerful in Palestine and in Iraq now, obviously, vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Here's a group, very interesting, a little bit more professional. These are professional hackers that had got together and developed a plan to attack Israel. Four-step plan. First, hit Israeli, official Israeli government sites Second, you hit economic sites, the Bank of Israel uh, and the Stock Exchange. Three, you want to hit the Internet Service Provider Infrastructure. Uh, and four, they wanted to affect Israel's ability to support its security forces on the ground. So in any which way you were able to do that, um, you know, was terrific. Now, on this site, there was an oath, and I want to mention this because it's very interesting. If you post attack tools on the web, they might, you know, you might not have any unless you password protected, obviously. Um, but in, in this site, there, on this site, there was an oath. It said, I swear that I will not use any of these programs against anyone but Jews and Israelis. <laughs> All right, so uh, there you go. 
Now, here's an example of a non-cyber cyber attack, and this is very interesting. I want to read this to you as well. This says, uh, now, this is, Oma.com is a very popular, very important site in the Arab world. And they had allowed an attack portal to be established uh, within their site. Uh, however, it says, we have been, we've been forced to remove this site, the bandwidth providers to our ISP, after receiving many complaints from Zionists and their supporters in the UK, have threatened to cut off our internet connection if this site is not removed. We have therefore removed this site in order to keep the rest of UMA.com uh, uh, online. Most sincere apologies, the UMA.com team. And of course, the beauty of the internet was this was quickly up in you know, several other places uh, you know, for the attackers to, to uh, access. However, uh, you know, it's important to know that, you know, I mean, that a, a site with commercial interests, with a site with, uh, that is prominent on the web, uh, might not be the best place to post your tools. Okay, here's some pro-Palestinian targets. Um, and again, I just want to mention a couple, because uh, we've already covered some of this material. Um, the Israeli army got hammered during this period. And so they contracted out to the lower right side, AT&T, for backup support. Now, who do you think was the next target on the Palestinians' list? Okay, uh, AT&T itself uh, be became the target of a, of a lot of pressure around the world even. G-Force Pakistan started rerouting their traffic to Quest. There was an email campaign uh, to boycott AT&T. I mean, that's a, that's a serious threat. Um, so AT&T had to decide, what are we going to do here? You know, this is terrible. Um, but they decided that they had no other choice but just to declare that they were going to defend their network and their decision to support the Israeli army. Um, another great case was APAC. If you don't know about this uh, organization, the Arab Israel or the uh, what is it, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee in Washington, and APAC had its site broken into and its databases stolen. Uh, so this included the email addresses, personal information, and credit card numbers of all their members. You know, this is huge. You can post that stuff on the web, or you can just use it for your own uh, your own pleasure. Uh, okay, we mentioned uh, NetVision and how important that was already. Well, which brings it back to the United States. Our, one of our arguments is that this will get to the United States. Uh, any conflict will eventually get spilled in, in involving the United States just because as the largest player in international politics and the largest target in terms of uh, Internet sites, uh, we become uh, get sucked in. But there is a, a, a wonderful, not wonderful, there is an important case where the U.S. was directly involved. And in, in, recall in May 2001, a EP-3 spy plane, Navy spy plane, was forced down in, uh, in China. And, and for uh, several days there, there was a high-level diplomatic um, conflict between the United States and China of what to do with this plane. Eventually, the Chinese uh, disassembled it and returned it one piece at a time. Uh, but while this was going on, there was tremendous tension, and it was one of the earliest, well, it was the earliest uh, sort of severe crisis that the, the Bush administration had to deal with. And there was effort by the Bush administration and the Chinese to seek a resolution at a lower level of tension. They were trying to get their hands on it. This wasn't quite the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, where nuclear um, weapons are involved in staring at, at the abyss, but it was a serious crisis in which the government was trying to, to shut it down. Well, in the midst of this, uh, a, in tandem, if you will, with the diplomatic give and take, a hacker war almost erupted between the U.S. and, uh, and Chinese activities. There, were, there was um, a hacker portal set up to attack the Chinese from the U.S. side for the Chinese to attack the U.S. The U.S. Uh, was particularly effective in retaliation. Uh, uh, an individual or a group called Poison Box. We don't know much about them. If someone out there does wants to come up and tell us more afterwards, we'd like to hear that. Um, but it showed the. Uh, it was pouring gasoline on a fire that the diplomats at the top were trying to tamp down. As it happened, it didn't. Uh, the crisis ended peacefully, and it, and the the war sort of fizzled. The hacker war fizzled as a result. Interestingly, a year later, the Chinese. Uh, hacker community said they were going to launch sort of a demonstration attack this, the next year uh, on the anniversary. 
Uh, and, and then mysteriously, it was called off uh, just a few days before, it, suggesting that there was a fair bit more centralized command and control on the Chinese side, perhaps even uh, government involvement. We're getting the high sign, the hook here. Uh, let me just uh, emphasize a couple points in closing. One is that while this matters, we're not pretending that this is as important as weapons of mass destruction blowing up or, or even old-fashioned terrorist acts that where people are dying. But nevertheless, it has the potential to expand and extend a conflict that is happening at the kinetic level. And it, it provides an avenue for people to get involved who might not want to, or I mean, who might not be willing to be a suicide bomber, but might be willing to join in a hacker uh, war. What the governments can do in response is limited, as you know. Uh, and there is, it's very unlikely that international agreements are going to uh, um, er erase this problem. Can this kind of hacking actually affect and influence ongoing military operations? Yes, it can, we think. Uh, it can to a lesser extent, uh, but perhaps primarily through propaganda. And one of the interesting new f forms of vulnerability are all of the military blogging that goes on with uh, soldiers in the field sort of keeping blogs of what they're doing, giving the opportunity to hack those sites and, and sort of poison uh, the blogs. Could it uh, spark a real war? Probably not, but it can complicate it. And it, it bears emphasis that the political leadership that are trying to control a conflict or a contest may be wildly disconnected from the uh, internet or the cyber realities that are going on. And there's no time for this, but I'll tell you my story afterwards about Oliver North and how he was caught because he didn't understand about email. Uh, we can talk about that afterwards. The most powerful cyber attack of all, though, is the propaganda one. And these are the pic infamous pictures of Abu Ghraib. When they're um, true and horrible pictures like this one, uh, they can be effective. But they don't have to be true to be effective. The British got hit with fraudulent photos uh, that nevertheless had a very profound effect on British morale uh, and got the British in trouble, even though they were, they were clearly faked. And with that sobering uh, bit of conclusion, why don't we wrap it up now? Thank you.